Andrew Cardoso from Creative Electron. And today we're going to be discussing a very polemic topic, counterfeit electronic components. Counterfeit components are no longer a threat, they are reality. Senators Brown and Carper recently urged the administration to address this issue that it has infiltrated not only the Department of Defense, but also every single part of our supply chain. Our troops put their lives on the line for us every day, and we owe it to them to ensure that the equipment that they depend on to do their job is safe and secure, said uh, Senator Carper. This threat has been met with a lot of focus from the Department of Justice. Here are just two of the recent examples of uh, companies that have gotten in trouble for selling counterfeit uh, electronic components. Uh, here on the left uh, is uh, the case of Vision Tech, and on the right is the case of uh, Titronics, companies that uh, combined have sold millions of dollars of electronic, uh, counterfeit electronic components to the Department of Defense. So, why have counterfeit components increased so dramatically uh, in the past few years? Um, one of the major, one of the drivers is uh, the budget cuts from the Department of Defense, that, have, that has created the need to replace uh, destroyed or inoperable military electronics, uh, which in turn creates this big demand for obsolete components. And that's where counterfeits get in. You have obsolete components needed in the market, they just go ahead, fabricate counterfeit components that look just like the obsolete components you need, and they sell to you. Another issue that we have is, um, as uh, economic times, um, get into a recession mode, uh, only we see longer delivery times from original component manufacturers, the OCMs. We've also seen an improvement in the technology that allows counterfeiters to sell their components and not be detected, which then have, has allowed them to expand from only military and aerospace uh, markets to remark and sell uh, comp electronic components to other markets, including uh, even commercial markets, automotive, medical, pretty much anything you can imagine as far as electronic components, uh, you're going to find a fair share of counterfeit parts. Now, um, here are some misconceptions in this market. One is that Counterfeit components are one in a thousand risk, and it's not going to happen to me. Independent distributors have said that up to 35% of the income product they receive is suspect counterfeits. Only bad distributors sell counterfeit components. That's another thing you cannot rely on. Even good and legit independent distributors sometimes make bad decisions, and those poor decisions might lead to counterfeit components getting into the supply chain. Only expensive components are counterfeited. That's another misconception. The Department of Commerce has reported that over 60% of counterfeited parts have a sale value of less than $10. Counterfeit components will be detected by electrical tests. That's another misconception. More than half of all counterfeit components have a die with a similar functionality, but it is still counterfeited. So they will pass electrical tests, but it's still a counterfeit component that creates danger to the application where it's going to be inserted. So here are some of the economic drivers of this massive counterfeit market. There is this surplus stock of electronic components that's dumped in the market, which then allows for brokers and uh, gray markets to prosper buying and selling components with no traceability. There's a huge amount of scrap electronics that's sent overseas uh, with no traceability again, right? I mean, it goes and uh, we don't know what happens without the electronics. Components are made obsolete faster and faster today, leaving this trail of uh, obsolete parts that um, need uh, to be uh, fulfilled for many years to come in applications like aerospace and the military. Uh, there's been a need and a pressure for short and short delivery times, so companies are pressured to buy just in stock or um, um, components putting pressure in supply chain to come up with parts uh, sooner and sooner. There's also been a massive cost reduction pressure by OEM buyers 
to reduce, reduce the price of the articles they're buying. And finally, buying and selling via the internet has become a common practice. So some brokers don't even, so, they don't even see the parts that they sell you. They just drop ship from one, drop ship from one uh, facility to another without even touching the parts they are selling. So here's one example, uh, this is one photograph of uh, component harvesting, which is a common practice activity from counterfeit, uh, counterf counterfeiters. So they get some, some of our old electronics, they harvest the parts from it, clean them up, put back on tubes and trays and uh, reels, and uh, sell them back to us. The U.S. Department of Commerce recently issued a report uh, tracing where uh, counterfeit components come from. And uh, brokers and independent distributors have their lion's share of the problem with 50 and 45 percent, respectively. But what's interesting is that even OEMs, prime subcontractors, DE depots, OCMs have shown with, um, you know, with uh, an interesting and, and relevant amount of counterfeit parts. So we know the counterfeits are an ubiquitous threat to the supply chain. Uh, and that increased market awareness has been met with a high level of sophistication by the counterfeiters. So true protection doesn't mean that we can overnight eliminate the problem. It means that we have to stay a step ahead or at least a few steps behind uh, the counterfeiter so that we can catch and eliminate counterfeit components from the supply chain. So how to fight this problem, how to fight and how to... Uh, how to make sure that it doesn't happen to doesn't happen to you? There's an estimated worldwide era loss due to electronic counterfeit components of over five billion dollars. This is one uh, example of a shopping mall uh, that you know that uh, markets uh, counterfeit everything electronic wise. Now. We're going to be discussing in this presentation uh, ways that you can find an X-ray inspection system to find counterfeit components. The great thing about X-ray inspection is that you get X-ray vision. You can see through stuff. So here's one example. On the left, you have an electronic component. On the right, you have the X-ray image of that same electronic component. So you can actually see inside and get the true nature of that electronic component. Now, X-rays are typically used in some of our other presentations in, the, uh, in our educational channel show you uh, industrial and electronic applications of X-rays. This is one example. You can see a lot of detail here. You can see the wire bones. You can see uh, solder pads of this component on a surface on, um, on a print circuit board. Uh, and you can also see, in this case, a short circuit between the two pads. So this is the typical industry application of uh, X-ray inspection systems. What we're going to do today is utilize this technology to find counterfeit components, right? And uh, we came up with 10 simple ways, perhaps not that simple, but 10 ways to find counterfeit components using X-rays. Uh, and we're going to go over them one by one and show examples of how to do that. So we're going to uh, look, uh, we're going to see techniques such as uh, how to look for empty packages, search for lot anomalies, compare the samples you're looking at to known good samples. Uh, we're going to look for pinout mismatches that can give us some very interesting insight if the component is good or bad. Uh, we're going to look for missing wire bones, find internal defects on those components, identify external damage and what type of external damage are um, red flags as a potential counterfeit component. Also, a technique we've used in the past and it's very powerful is to measure BGA voiding. We're going to look for bent pins and finally we're going to look at uh, Diattached voiding, which can also be an indication that uh, something wrong with the parts. And again, uh, these techniques we're going to go over. Um, very few of them are, uh, and that's true for pretty much everything you do in, when looking for counterfeit components. Um, they give you red flags and that uh, indicate that you can you have to keep probing. But um, in these techniques, what you are looking for is um, you're looking for features on the component that will allow you to say that they are counterfeit, kind of they are uh, suspect, and they are bad. Very, this, none of these counterfeit kind of detection techniques can actually tell you that a component is authentic. They can tell you that a component is not authentic. 
So the first technique we're going to look at is empty package. And this is uh, better understood here using these two examples. On the left, you have a uh, 3D rendering of a good component. So you can see the pads, the die, uh, and some of the internal parts of the component. On the right, you just have an empty shell. So these components, <coughs> um, you know, when you components that are actually functional, they have a die inside with wire bones and other parts. If they just see an empty shell like this one, or just a lid frame, there's definitely a red sign that something's wrong. Uh, the second technique is to look for not an, uh, lot anomalies. And this is a very powerful technique. Uh, if you have a lot of a thousand parts uh, and um, they all share the same part number and uh, lot code, etc., they all have to look identical. That's what the semiconductor industry has worked for decades now, is to improve, to keep improving the uniformity of their lots. So the fact that you find one component that looks different from the other ones is a major red flag that the lot has to be uh, set aside as a suspect. The third technique is um, to compare to a non good sample. And that's a very straightforward uh, technique. Let's say you bought a lot uh, of a specific component and you buy it again uh, sometime later. <clears throat> as long as you uh, compare apples to apples, meaning that components that have the same lot code, date code, part number, place of manufacturing, external marketing and construction, you'll be able to determine that if that component is suspect or not. Keep in mind that uh, manufacturers, original component manufacturers, sometimes they change uh, lid frame and they change uh, wire bonding diagram as a function of a different place of manufacture, even as time goes by. So if you compare a component A uh, made today and component A made a year from today, uh, those two uh, may look different, even though it's the same part number. So keep that in mind when you do your assessment of counterfeit components. The fourth technique is a very powerful one, which is a pinout mismatch. And this, I like this technique because it doesn't really require comparing to anything. So with one image, you can make an assessment if that part is suspect or not. And here's what you do. You start with uh, an x-ray of the electronic component that you're looking at, right? That you don't know if it's a suspect or not. So you start with that first x-ray and just by looking at x-ray, uh, you can make some um, assessments on what the pin should be, right? Uh, starting with the one on the top left here, you know that that pin is has uh, you know has the two fingers connected with multiple wire bones to the die. Most likely, this is a power pin, and you know a VDD. So let's say this one is probably a VDD. The one top right corner here is not connected to anything. You see the lead uh, stops uh, in the plastic encapsulation; it's not connected or wire bonded anywhere else. So that's got to be a no connect. The bottom right, uh, as you can see here, uh, connects to this finger going to the die, and it's also connected to the back of the die. And that's commonly the ground because you want the, the you know the back of the substrate of the die to be sitting on a ground plane uh, to keep it quiet. <clears throat> and also for uh, thermal uh, dissipation, you connect it to the ground. So for that reason, this is very very likely the ground pin. And again, we haven't, we don't even know what component this is, right? It's relevant just by looking at uh, the pin and the uh, uh, geography of the lead frame, uh, you can make those assumptions. Now you can look at the uh, part number and figure out uh, the uh, pinout, right? And you can even overlay the pinout on top of the x-ray. And then you can compare if your assumptions were correct or not. In this case, uh, check this out. VDD is on the top right, and we assess this as a no connect, which is a massive red flag. Finally, this pin that we thought was ground is indeed a data pin DQ3. Massive red flag. This should be ground. This should not be uh, a data uh, data pin. And finally, where we thought was VDD is actually VPP. So just by overlaying the real pinout on an X-ray image, after you've done some, uh, you know, some analysis of what the geography of the, uh, the lead frame should look like, you can determine if this is a red flag or not. This is a very powerful technique.
The fifth one is to look for missing wire bond. And um, this is a common technique, uh, just to make sure that uh, there is a die inside, you know, it's not empty. But the caveat is that uh, aluminum wire bonds are not visible under x-rays. And for that reason, even if you don't see uh, wire bonds when you take an x-ray, just be careful to do some further analysis to make sure that those are not aluminum wire bonds. The sixth technique we're going to look today is internal defects. And um, those are a little, a little bit more um, hard to find. Uh, because they do require a, a little uh, more detailed analysis of the uh, of the actual of the component. <clears throat> in this example, uh, as you can see here, during our analysis of this um, of this part, uh, we found that lonely um, um, wire bond uh, location. And upon further analysis of the part, we were able to find the wire bond sitting um, on the other side of the component. Now. You can say this is not necessarily a counterfeit component, right? It can be a failure analysis issue, not a counterfeit issue. And I agree, this is one, one of those um, examples where it's on the boundary between if it's a, counterfeit, a counterfeited part or a part that just failed from the manufacturer. But regardless, it might have been a counterfeit because it has been stored improperly. And for that reason, it should be raised uh, a red flag. The seventh example we show here are uh, external defects on the part. More specifically for ball grid arrays, uh, this is one example of uh, damaged balls uh, that should not happen if the parts have been properly handled uh, from the original component manufacturer all the way to your hands. The eighth example is to look for excessive voiding on ball grid arrays. And this, is a, this provides very interesting insight on um, reballing techniques. So when ball grid arrays, when they're pulled from a um, uh, PCB, uh, they have to be warmed up, they're pulled, and the balls are destroyed. So the counterfeiter has to clean up the BGA and reball it. Now, this process of reballing is, um, is, is tricky. It's not, it's not easy. You have to know the metallurgy of the pads and the metallurgy of the balls that you're applying to do it right. A lot of counterfeiters don't do it right. As a result, there's a lot of voiding in that interface between the ball and the component. So by doing a uh, BGA voiding um, analysis, uh, you actually, some counterfeited parts, you can find a lot of voiding. And if you find a lot of voiding, that's a massive red flag that should take in consideration to determine the uh, authenticity of this component. The ninth uh, technique we use all the time is to look for bent pins. It's very common um, to find counterfeit parts or suspect parts inside trays uh, and tubes with bent pins. That's, that happens often if the parts have been stored in the wrong trays or the wrong uh, um, uh, anti-static um, carriers, right? And uh, which might lead you to look into the carrier if it is indeed anti-static or not. And, uh, there's a wide range of counterfeiter carriers for electronic components. Finally, the 10th um, step that we use all the time is to look for excess die-attached voiding. And we have, you know, there are several tools to measure die-attached voiding, but if you find a lot of voiding uh, inside the component, it might be because these components have not been stored properly. If they weren't stored in high humidity, high temperature environments, um, you might have a case where uh, water has uh, seeped into the component and created the external voiding. So, some of the takeaways from our presentation today is that uh, confirmed electronics, it's a massive multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. It's not going anywhere. It's probably going to be getting worse for, for uh, many years to come. And x-ray systems are very powerful to, to find counterfeit components. All right. And uh, some of the techniques that we uh, covered today include looking for empty packages, search for lot anomalies, compare the samples you're looking at to known good samples, Look for pinout mismatch. We saw an example of how powerful that technique is. We're also going to be looking for missing wire bones. We're going to look for uh, internal defects on the components. 
and also look for external damage to, uh, to the part. We're going to measure the VGA voiding, measure the void in each one of the balls and look for um, you know, excessive voiding that might be um, an indication of reballing. We're also going to look for bent pins, which might indicate uh, inadequate uh, um, package of those components. And finally, we're going to look for that attach voiding. I hope this was useful. Um, if you'd like more information, please feel free to call us at 760-752-1192 or look us online at creativeelector.com. Thanks so much for your time.